I'm Joel Baird, the general manager of Missoula Community Access Television, inviting you to this talk show about Mark Gibbons. He became Montana's Poet Laureate in September of 2021. With me is Kim Anderson, who's Director of Program and Grants for Humanities Montana. Welcome both of you. Thanks for taking the time to talk poetry. We thought that um, we would take this opportunity, Joel and I, to introduce Mark uh, and to let him talk about a new, uh, an exciting program that he's inaugurating with Humanities Montana and the Montana Arts Council's help. Um, Mark is Montana's 10th Poet Laureate. Ten because last the last uh, biennial poet laureates there were two for the first time ever. So Mark is Montana's tenth poet laureate. He is the author of eleven volumes of poetry. Um, Mark earned his MFA in creative writing at the University of Montana. Uh, he's the recipient of a uh, Montana Arts Council's Artist Innovation Award. Uh, he has served as a judge and mentor for Poetry Out Loud, the national program that encourages students to recite great works of poetry. He's been doing that for years. Um, he's the editor of Foothill Publishing's Montana Poets series. And his newest collection, In the Weeds, was recently published by Drum Lumen Institute. It's a, a massive collection of new and beautiful work and really wonderful. I've been reading it over the last few days and, and enjoying it very, very much. In fact, uh, Richard Fifield, who's a, a friend of Humanities Montana and of literature and a great writer himself, has got the greatest blurb, which is, this collection is a flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is, it is. Um, and I've known Mark for many, many years um, because he's been a poet in the schools working with um, most recently the Missoula Writing Collaborative um, for over 30 years, is that right? No, not quite that long, but uh, probably about 25, I think. Wow. 96 would be about 25. Well, it? all I know is that he was the poet in my son Charlie's fifth grade classroom. Oh, wow. Uh, and my son Charlie is now 33 years old. So <laughs> I, just, I just flashed on Charlie's Christ. Yes. <laughs> at Gethsemane. You know, it was like, I, oh yeah, go ahead. Sounds like a go memorable ahead. poem. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark yeah. changed Charlie's life. So I have owed Mark uh, a huge debt uh, for all these many, many years. Um, so welcome, Mark. Thank and um, one of the things that uh, the Montana Arts Council and Humanities Montana do to support, support the Poet Laureateship is um, we support them in giving presentations around the state and working with groups all over Montana. Uh, travel is a still a little difficult in Montana, and Mark came up with a brilliant idea for how he could get the word out about poetry and poets in Montana and uh, this is kind of a way of inaugurating that project, and I'd love to turn it over to you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, the idea of what to do uh, in the pandemic. I know the last two Poets Laureate were challenged by mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and so I, I thought, you know, trying to just create an archive of poets I mean, some of uh, some of the my old friends who were great Montana poets, uh, Ed Leahy, uh, Dexter Roberts, uh, Mary Laura Wilson, who was uh, uh, Ed Leahy's ex-wife and, and a wonderful poet, which I got involved in later here in life. But uh, they all didn't; uh, they weren't recorded that much. You know, I mean, Ed should have been recorded way more than he was, uh, because he was just such of a gifted orator. And uh, so I thought, you know, to try to catalog, archive as many poets as I could gather, and there's a whole hell, of, there's a whole lot of them. I'm not gonna, no, I, I, I'm, and that's it's gonna get nasty before we're through. <laughs> You'll find that out in upcoming episodes. Uh, because I talk kind of like a mule skinner, so you'll have to get used to that or just turn the channel. Uh, anyway, uh, I've recorded some people, and I will record more. And some of them will be Zoom, re Zoom recordings because of the pandemic. Many of them are going to be live in this studio. Maybe at some point next year we might even get outside and do some different things. It would be kind of fun to do yeah. some different things. So, so we'll do that. We're going to record a bunch of uh, 
of poets reading their work and just sort of yabbering with me. And, uh, and then that'll be on MCAT, right? Right. And, and it'll also be available for people to then stream. That's right. Because right. MCAT can put the work on our video on demand. So mm -hmm. people go to MCAT.org, watch now, and then it will say video on demand. They could search for your name mm -hmm. or the name of a poet they may be interested in that you had uh, an interview with. Right. And voila, no matter where they are in the state, if the internet connection yes. is solid, yeah. they can join in that conversation and or be part of. We'll right. be sharing those links on the Humanities Montana website, and I'm sure that they'll also be on the Montana Arts Council website. And this is what I was thinking about. Musicians often point to this, and, some, you know, and certainly performers of, of all sorts, in front of a live audience. There's no substitute for that energy. No. So a question for a poet, do you feel it? Do you feel it when you're giving a reading in front of people compared to speaking into a microphone? Oh, oh totally. Yeah? Yeah, oh yeah, totally. And I mean, Mark's it, it, a it's, very dynamic it's, reader. It's the yeah. same thing, it's the same thing as, as uh, it's the interaction, it's the same thing with a, with a stage, with a play. It's the yeah. same thing, I, the, I, I say it's the same thing musicians go through, I would not know that. But uh, <laughs> I mean, just it, it, the, all the, the nervousness before you begin to do something, but the interaction with an audience or the lack thereof, <laughs> you know, that, that's like all the difference in the world, you know? I mean, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's totally, like last night, it was just, I just kept going and I periodically interrupt and say, I hope this is going well because you know how weird this is? Right. <laughs> Sitting in a room all by myself trying to dramatically present these poems. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, it is what it is and, and we, we're, we're making the most of it and, and they, they enjoyed it. They, you get feedback. We did the whole Q&A thing and so they... I got some feedback and I felt better about it. I hope they liked it. <laughs> and the presentation Mark is talking about, um, any community, right now all of our Montana Conversations programs, which is a catalog of programs that Humanities Montana makes available to communities, any community organization around the state for free. Um, our, the Poet Laureate is always in that catalog as a presenter and right now Mark is, uh, when he's able, booking virtual programs like he did in Lewistown last night. Um, and hopefully uh, in the months ahead, he'll be able to do some traveling as well. So if you're interested in bringing Mark to a community uh, gathering that you're creating, you can go to the Humanities Montana, Montana Conversations catalog. So this in this show, we're interviewing you, kind of. We want to get to know you a little bit, and then we, we're, you're going to take over from here and be interviewing all sorts of poets from around the state. So tell us about you. You're a native-born Montanan, small-town Montanan, right? I grew up just 30 miles west of here in Alberton, and uh, my, uh, my father worked for the Milwaukee Railroad, and my mother was a great railroad wife. You know, up at two o'clock in the morning, making, uh, making. Uh, I should just read a poem. Sometimes I feel like I should answer these questions by just reading a goddamn poem. <laughs> well, um, we hope you're uh, going to read. I, poem, I will. So I will. Do so, it whenever but, it but yeah, you. no. Uh, <laughs> but my uh, so my mom and dad, uh, we lived in Alberton. And uh, I graduated from Alberton High School in 1972. Uh, and I, I kind of told a little bit of this kind of a story last night, I guess, to those Lewistown people. And that is that uh, we didn't have a lot of books in the house, you know, mm -hmm. when I was a kid. But my old man, my father, was a, was a voracious reader who worked the library relentlessly. Mm -hmm. You know, he was that guy. And, uh, but the one book we had in the house, and I didn't bring it with me, was a collection that I think he got from a friend of his, and he never returned it, because that guy's name's in the front cover. <laughs> and uh, it's, the, it's the collected poetry of Robert Service. Really? You know, uh, Robert Service, The Cremation of Sam. Yeah, yes. I love that one <laughs> yes. as a seventh grader, because it was like music. With the rhyme, it's a ballad. And all it's, that. A, it's musical. It's a ballad, and it is full of such intense and crazy ass energy. And and it's just a lot like Montana Winter, but it's up in the Yukon, right? Right. And uh, 
the first time he, because we didn't have a TV until like second grade or something like that. I, I was in second grade. And uh, so he, sometimes he, we, he read some of those poems to us in the evening, you know, when you weren't playing games or some other thing. And, uh, and he read, the first time he read The Cremation of Sam McGee, I just like, whoa, man, that was, that was, that was it. And, uh, and so it goes, uh, there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge, I cremated Sam McGee. Now that, Sam McGee. <laughs> that will get you hooked in, wouldn't it? Yeah. Then you lean in oh, like, Oh my God. What? All that great ballad <laughs> rhythm and those rhymes. Yeah. And, oh, I love that. You know. Well, and, and so you know, the, next, the next obvious step in my education, uh, as far as poetry goes, was m my sister's phonograph. I mean, yeah. uh, she had all these old rec 45 RPM records, you know, which is what you bought back then at that time with yeah. the old uh, high fidelity uh, record player. And, and I just would listen to those things. And just like that Robert Service poem, I fell in love with the music mm -hmm. and, the, and the language. I was actually just reading an article this morning before I came here about a, a poet who was confessing. He was young, he's younger than us. I say us. It's <laughs> By a few years. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so he, uh, he, he mentioned that his, his family, he never saw the Beatles. He, he never heard the Beatles. He knew oh. nothing about the Beatles, you know, until he was like in high school. They, they listened to country and some bluegrass and some different stuff. And he said they were, he was at a pizza parlor and... Uh, he was in high school at a pizza parlor. He went over to the jukebox to put a couple of coins in, and he was just looking around, and he saw this stuff by the Beatles. And he thought, you know, I should pay, I should check this out because mm -hmm. what's all this fuss? Everybody keeps talking about the Beatles. He's about, you know, 12, 15 years younger than we are. And uh, so he put in a quarter, and he punched up the 45, which had Strawberry Fields on one side and Penny Lane on the uh -huh. other. And he listened to Strawberry Fields, and uh, it blew him away, right? Forever. Nothing, nothing is real and nothing to get hung about. Yeah. Oh, my God. He was like, what the hell? <laughs> what kind of language is that? Who writes like that? What's this all about? He was not a poet at that point, right? He hadn't experienced poetry. And in the same way that that stuff led me, I think, into poetry eventually, uh, is, be is because of just that, the music, right? Yeah. The music and the language and the imagery. You have a, you've written a great poem about that, about listening to your sister's record player. Right. <laughs> can you do it? You want that poem? I think I can do it, yeah. <laughs> I did it last night for those people because, because of this same conversation, pretty yeah. much. My sister was 11 years older than me, and... Uh, and she got married at like 18, so she left early. She left at 17, and uh, when she left, I was the baby. She was the oldest. When she left, she said, you can have my phonograph. Oh. And all those records, oh, my God, because I was just constantly at it, you know. And so I, uh, I started listening to all those records, and, uh, and my sister, uh, who's passed away at this point in time, uh, had Parkinson's disease for about 35 years or so. And, uh, and she dealt with it really well. I mean, she was with great grace and humor, uh, as much as someone can deal with those kinds of things. And uh, so on, on what birthday it was, I wrote her this poem uh, for a birthday present. And I kind of, you know, picked those, uh, some of those song lyrics and stuff to kind of litter through the thing. And uh, so this is your, <coughs> pardon me, that probably blew the microphone right out of the place. <laughs> this is your bad karaoke experience with, uh, with my, uh, <laughs> my poem for my sister. It's uh, called Music My Sister Gave Me. 
sitting outside in my s &H green stamps rocking chair, in the shade of the cottonwood tree, I played records, 45s you'd left behind, Pat Boone, Bill Haley, and Elvis. Those old, your old RCA hi-fi fit perfect, one square of the sidewalk that circled our house you left at 17. I taped a stack of pennies on the metal tone arm to keep the needle in the grooves. I want you, I need you, I love you with all my heart. I needed you like Rock Hudson needed Doris Day, the way Murphy, our Norwegian elk hound, wanted me to lay my ear on his belly so I could listen to him gurgle inside. Put a chain around my neck and lead me anywhere, won't you let me, let me. Let me. The phonograph stylus needed more weight, but I knew if I touched it, there was a 50-50 chance. A zap jolt of electricity would shoot up my arm, buzz my teeth, my Peter, and my hair. Those shocks were funny with you, laughing when I jerked, but scary when I was alone after you'd gone. For oh, my darling, I love you, and I always will, too. Is it like that with Parkinson's disease? Like your life is skip, skip, skipping away? I wish I could fix it, fix it. Do something simple as grounding your haywired connections, the erratic, erratic puppet dance your pills drag you through. Dyskinesia is better than nothing, you say. If you stop, you'll turn to stone. Don't be cruel to a heart that's true. No matter how much you joke, joke, joke about it, about dancing or running out of gas, the jerking, the shaking, the kicks and the sweats, your yanked expression holding on for the ride saps this wooden heart of mine, the one I carved for you. Tell me, who pulls the strings, laughs and cries for marionettes? You taught me, big sister, after 30 odd years, the folly of pity and shame. Yes, any way you want me, that's how I will be, he, he. Three, when I was just six years old, you left me the medicine of music. Connie Francis, Johnny Mathis, the Everly Brothers, Conway Twitty, Johnny Cash, and Percy Faith. Remember the day we danced with Murphy around the yard, wild as the raging sea. You held his front paws and I pulled his curly tail tongue lolling out the side of his mouth, head thrown back, he rocked to the beat, the whites of his eyes flashed. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. We hopped and spun till we tumbled in a pile on the grass, laughed so hard it hurt my gut. Murphy panted beside us, kept time to the revolving click of the stylus riding the groove at the end of the record. I couldn't move, but felt soothed by rhythm. Your stomach bobbed my head. In my mind, we were motion like Elvis. I gyrated my hips. You tossed your hair. I'm in love. Uh, I'm all sugar. Bum. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm all shook up. And then I usually say, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was great. <laughs>
I couldn't believe you could remember all that. I know. Like as it came, you know. I cry every time I hear that book. Oh, it is really sad. <laughs> and it's really good though, because it has that thing about the folly yeah. of pity mm -hmm. and shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's an entertainment. I mean, you know, at the bottom line, I always thought that that's what I liked about poetry. The poetry I liked, anyway, was it was an entertainment. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, I mean, besides being more than that, uh, I mean, it can be a lot deeper and stronger than that, but it should be an entertainment, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a wonderful poem, well, I, Mark. That I, I, captures I, so much I, of that little world uh, of being uh, children. Yeah. And I, 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 hopefully that's what, that's what a, a poem will do, uh, is that it will trigger just what it did with you. Yeah, yeah, I like mean, it I, takes you it, right it, back it, to it, your it, own experience. It, exactly. You, you, you rewrite your own thing while, yeah. while you're listening to it. You know? and, and you come up with a narrative, like I say, oh, my sister and I played this game. But when you're reciting the poem, it's more like being there. Mm -hmm. There's no story. You mm -hmm. kind of experience what it was like to be there. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You feel the Hopefully. emotion. Hopefully, yeah. 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 So, first, like the the dramatic narrative and the and the and the kind of music of Robert Service, and then music from your sister on right, through you. Right. Right. Um, but and then, and, well, you want me to interrupt you? Yeah. You, yes, no, you're, you're, no, you're going, you some, you're going somewhere with this. I'm saying, what yeah. then? Then what well, was the next step? Well, the next step was, I mean. The next step was I, I I dug rock and roll and at that you know I I was going to be a rock star yeah right oh. I, I couldn't even I couldn't even play three chords on the guitar but but you uh, had one I, I, <laughs> my brother had one and he mm. could play and so I try I kind of went uh, yeah you know, so but uh, what happened was I started you know, I, I guess about a freshman in high school probably I had some great English teachers you know this was like in the in the uh, late 60s early 70s and all of a sudden young teachers started showing up and, and even out in Alberton Montana and <laughs> and we started getting you know a little bit different more exciting material more modern stuff as in as if modernism was all that modern in you know that at that time it was right. already 50 years old but uh, anyway uh, I started uh, reading more and I decided that wow I was really digging reading, uh, you know, all kinds of literature kind of reading. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, this, they said, well, we've got a program. We have a guest uh, writer coming to the school. And it was like the first year that the Montana Arts Council, I don't, I don't know if it was the first year. I think it might have been. It was 1970. And uh, anyway, this, this writer was coming to work with a group of kids who wanted to get out of the main class, the main English class, and just write poetry. And I'm like, oh, I'm down with that. <laughs> who doesn't want to get out of the main the English phrase, class, right? get out yeah, of, exactly. built in. It doesn't matter what you're going to do. So, so uh, I did that, and uh, it was James Welch. Oh my God, Isn't Jim that Welch. Amazing? Jim Welch was working for the Arts Council. I didn't do it very long, and according to Lois, we may have put him over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> it was he, the last he, assignment, he, Albert he, Ten months. She Canada. said he really didn't enjoy that. <laughs> he wasn't a teacher, you know. He just didn't. Uh, he, he was a writer, and uh, but but he came and he did a great job. And the main thing he did uh, for me, and I think for the other kids who were in the class, obviously. Uh, was that he he had was just on the verge of publishing writing the earth boy 40 which mm -hmm. is the first book he did and it's a collection of poetry i mean because he had studied with hugo yeah. and he had written poetry and then from there he went on to you know write winter in the blood and the death of jim loney and fool's crow and all the other books that he wrote uh, but he had those poems and he hadn't sent them out you know to or wherever the hell he published and uh he was reading them and sharing them with us and saying, wow. because this is what Hugo taught, right? I mean, you write, write what you know, write where you come from, that kind of thing. And so Jim was reading these poems that were written from between Harlem and Browning, and, uh, and they were native poems, and they were, the imagery was unique to his background, his family, his experience growing up. And, uh, and then, of course, what the poet does on top of that, which is 
make things up, probably. But uh, anyway, he shared those with us, and he said, this is what you guys should do. You should write about what you know. Write about, I mean, you're growing up in a railroad town in western Montana. Well, that's what you got to work with. You might as well <laughs> try to read uh, or try to write something like that. And so we did. We started writing these poems. And, and uh, once I started doing that in 1970, I never have quit. Huh. You know, I mean, it was just like, pardon me while I get verklempt. Uh -huh. It was just like, uh, it was like somebody that opened a door. Yeah. You know, it was like, this, you, you can do this the rest of your life. It doesn't matter if you ever publish a goddamn one of them. You can do this for the rest of your life. And that, uh, mm, that is the experience that I've tried to take to, to kids, is that everybody should write poetry. And, and we're all poets. Whether you write it down or not, we're still poets, because a poet is nothing but cataloging what we do as human beings. And if you want to get a little crafty with it, you want to spend a lot of time at it, you can maybe make yourself into a poet uh, at that point on paper and then orally. But uh, uh, basically, that's, that's my, uh, my two bits worth on that. And uh, now I'll try to regroup while you talk about, <laughs> your, talk about yourselves. Well, you know, I mean, you really have continued that tradition that didn't start with Hugo, but in, in Montana is very much associated with Hugo, of kind of poetry from and about working class people. Mm -hmm. um, and things that were for, uh, in a certain tradition not considered worthy of notice. Um, and that Welch then took on. And I mean, you have in your bio a long, long list of uh, jobs that you've held over your life. Um, Montana. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We all know. Try, trying to stay in Montana. They right? call it the gig economy now, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. been around the a The view tax was another one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you bring a lot of that, you know, and often what, what it's considered blue collar work, mm. and you bring a lot of that into your poetry, don't you? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to write uh, where you, uh, what you know, I mean, that's what I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up in a you know working class environment, and you know, and to uh, for better or worse, it's it kind of. I mean, I I don't think it's worse, but it, it's sort of hamstrung me in a way. Uh, you know, I mean, I I uh, that's another part of my background, I guess. Uh, you're talking about backgrounds, is I had you know alcohol played a big part in my growing up experience, mm -hmm. and when that happens, anybody that that's had that experience in a family, or and almost everybody has, depending on how close it is. But anyway, if it's if it's one of your parents, it's going to make an incredible uh, uh, impression on you. I mean, it's like the first time I remember reading Angela's Ashes. Mm. I read that goddamn book, and I thought, I oh, talk about mm -hmm. open the floodgates. Right. Well, I, anyway, I was talking about handicapping yeah. myself, and, yeah. and part of that is uh, the fact that. I never felt comfortable in a step up in class. I never felt comfortable at the University of Montana. It's just funny. It's just odd. Yeah. It's just, it's just. Oh, you're saying you felt like a split between the elitism people associate with academia and your working class background. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, I mean, I, I, I wanted to go to college. I loved what you could get there. I loved literature. Literature. I consider myself an intellectual, but by God, I sure as hell didn't want to be seen that way. And I couldn't really feel comfortable in that kind of a social situation or gathering. I've just felt like an outsider in that regard all of my life. So that's why I've always when people say, well, why don't you write about, you know, teaching and things like that? And it's like, I don't know, because my head is stuck in, you know, some kind of blue-collar job, uh, which I have done to survive, because that's what a lot of us have done to survive in this state. So that's kind of uh, part of my makeup, I guess. It's part of what I write about. You, you know, you just, uh, you, you write about who you are. And, and alcohol, obviously, plays a... And, and, you know, that's another one that I decided that I needed to try out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of times you grow up with a drunk, 
which is how I, I phrase it, an alcoholic parent, you, you move away from that. You say, I'm never going to touch a drop. Yeah. And then there are those others that go, I've got to find out what the hell that's all about. Right. And so then you go down that road and you spend a lot of time working at it. And it's like, well, you got to try harder. you got to get deeper into it. you got to get blackout <laughs> stupid drunk to really discover what the hell's at the root of this. Well, you do that uh, uh, enough and uh, you, uh, it, it kind of, uh, it affects you in the same way that it affected the parent. And uh, I, so I did that for a while. I don't, you know, I mean, I pretty much have, I think, control of myself uh, and have had for quite a while. Until I was about 30, I was just kind of a, one of those people that ran around and got, Hard whacked, drinker. got whacked and, you know, yeah. took other things and did the things that everybody did that I was around back then. Well, and I mean, combining a childhood and then there, there's a whole writer's kind of mythology around that, yeah. around alcoholism. The drunken bard. Yeah. Eddie's club. The ecstatic state. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and the, uh, the, 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 the suffering, the pain that a lot of people experienced, I guess, in those situations, and then you, 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 you read it in their writing, maybe I'm more attracted to that because I kind of can really relate to it, but I think almost everybody is kind of really attracted to that. Mm -hmm. There's something about a, a brutal honesty or something that comes out of it that everybody goes, yeah, we're all vulnerable people. We're all, you know, doomed to fail in one way or another at something, and we're all going to die. And so, I mean, what a perfect formula for being a poet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is. You know, I remember when I, I, taught, I taught high school for a while, you know, after I got my shit together and decided to have kids and, and become a high school teacher. Uh, and I remember having this is one freshman high school class, and uh, it, it was the end of the day. It wasn't a big class. It was all boys for the most part. And I said, uh, okay, so we're going to start a section on poetry. And this kid goes, ah. You know, like well, somebody just, somebody just shot him with a gun, you know. Or something. I said, what, 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 what? He says, a bunch of old white guys writing about death. <laughs> and I thought, well, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. The primary then, you know, theme of Western <laughs> civilization's song. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine that, you know, 14, 15, why you wouldn't be interested in that. <laughs> no, Particularly if you weren't an old white guy or a, a white kid. Maybe, you know, whatever. Well, someone had said, you know, that the object of poetry was uh, to express the inexpressible. Mm -hmm. So it always seems like there's, you know, quite a high bar to mm -hmm. try to meet if you have that in your lens, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's such a mystique, you know, around poetry, let's say, versus being a songwriter. There mm -hmm. does seem like a difference, but I can't really, you know, point to it. Whether, whether or not it goes way back, you know, to Homeric traditions in Western culture, I, I'm not sure. You know, the, yeah, I mean, all, all the references to, you know, oh, it's like poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Michael, yeah. jo Michael Jordan plays basketball. Like poetry. <laughs> You know, it's I, that it, it, ineffable, that inexpressible, yeah, that the right, sights right, right. were set well, and that's maybe so high. Well, and that's the ultimate art form, right? R right, right, right. For some reason, it gets top billing, which is so ironic, right? Because you can't, you can't scrape a nickel together. Right, from you get compensated no. the yeah. least. You, you can't, you can't, you can't buy an ice cream cone no. from your poetry sales. You know, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. But laurels, you get, you get paid in oh, laurels. Yes. <laughs> Going to read something well, for I, us? I, well, I just this this came to mind. I mean, it's nothing, uh, uh, nothing wild. Uh, it's just in regard to that conversation we just had. This was something I, uh, I, I wrote uh, a while back in this little book called Shadow Boxing, which is a which is a real downer. Uh, I've been told by, well, some people. <laughs> just the facts about poetry. Nobody buys it. Nobody reads it. But everybody agrees it's really important because, you know, it's poetry and it means something. But nobody knows what 
it means. Nobody understands the poem's hidden agenda or the journey that goes nowhere they've ever been or wanted to be. And by nobody, you mean everybody who doesn't get it or have a degree in modern poetry, which is almost everybody you know walking down the street or in and out of bookstores. So how does poetry hold on to its reputation as serious literature when nobody seems to spend any energy consuming it? Who knows? These old notions die hard, like American democracy. People want to believe in the power of words, the way poetry can make you feel, can transport you to another world, like a Zen Zen dream of peace without fear, a place that you know doesn't really exist, and serious pragmatists can't ignore the facts. Mm. <laughs> One of the things I remember years ago when I first started seeing, uh, uh, when I guess when you, <laughs> CDs were all of a sudden it were in vogue, you know, no after, the, after the record. You're time. not putting pennies on your CDs. CD player. Yeah. Well, I mean, they started publishing books of poetry with a CD yeah. in, the, mm. in the cover right. sleeve. And the poet would read poems, and I thought, God, this is going to catch on. This is really yeah. great, because I like to hear it out loud. You yes. know? I mean, I think poetry is an, is an oral art form, and is meant to be heard out loud. It doesn't have to be, and I can appreciate it dead cold on the page, but it's an oral art form, and uh, you know, it, was, it was done for centuries before anything was ever written down, yeah. right? It just passed along. And uh, and so I think that was a great idea. Didn't catch on, obviously. <laughs> I don't see, I don't see <laughs> but any... But it, it should have. I mean, uh, yes, you can read a piece of a, a, a poem on a page, but if it's a poem that you are drawn to, don't you always read it out loud? I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe a, a, a kind of close to a wrap-up question about, you know, wh how you see your role as Poet Laureate. You have two years. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's you know we we always just kind of blithely say is going to celebrate poetry in Montana and mm -hmm. blah 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 but I mean I how do you feel about this public role an official role? Uh, well, I mean uh, the the downside to uh, asking me to be the poet laureate for two years <laughs> uh, is that you're just going to get this, <laughs> you know, and and. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not great at, uh, I don't have big plans, I don't have big agendas. I live day to day. I write a lot of poems. I love being around people who want to share their poems with me. That's one of the reasons why I thought the idea of archiving people would be great, to just have that available for people to eat up poems just like I like to eat them up and experiencing them out loud is even better. Um, I like, uh, I don't have a great answer uh, for the question simply because I don't know. Yeah. And, 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 and that's what I, I mean, who the hell knows what the future holds? I may be dead next week anyway. So, <laughs> I mean, I really don't know what the future holds, and I'm cool with that. And if, uh, you know, I mean, that's, you're going to, if you're along for this ride, if you're going to pay any attention to this at all, then, uh, then you'll find out what it's going to be like as it as it erupts, as it as it evolves, as it as it goes forward. I mean, I, I've tried to give it some thought because that's the way the world works, right? Especially if you get a role or an assignment or a you know you're elected or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, and all of a sudden you're expected to <laughs> what's on the agenda? What are we doing? You know, three months from now, I have no idea. Uh, probably a lot similar to what we're doing right now, living and, and chronicling that and, and trying to enjoy ourselves, being alive. That, that, that to me is most important. So I have no good, good, no good answer. I kind of like that. Good answer. Would you 
share another poem with us? I would love to. Uh, and I don't really have a... I have a book right here in my did, No, I have books. I have... <laughs> well, you've got, you got more got, books than I a got book so salesman. I got so many books. What kind of a poem would we like, I wonder? Should I read something from, from yeah, here? Yeah, do. How about uh, humility? I hope I don't die before I clean out the basement. There's bound to be embarrassments down there for my children. Obviously, nothing would bother me once I was dead. That said, I don't know why I'd care about being found out human by my kids. We all, we all know we are capable of Shakespearean faults and vain lusts, blindly murderous impulses, petty jealousies and fooleries. Still, it's difficult to let go of fearful parental roles, patterned after God, that one you thank out of reflex, knowing you'll be gone when they discover you were just another love-clumsy bag of air. I just read that poem. <laughs> That's really last good. Night. For the poet really laureate question. Home. It really did. <laughs> One more, uh, I guess. How about this? Because it's kind of about poetry. Uh, a little uh, Descartes for you. I think, therefore, I have made myself a poet by insisting I am a poet. After years of insisting I wasn't a poet, even though I did know it back then when I kept insisting I was just a guy who wrote the shit that came to mind. Those thoughts and observations we all have, but most don't take the time to write down. So, I became a poet by virtue of putting words on paper and publishing them in books, reading them aloud, and acknowledging the proclamations of others calling me a poet. I guess a poet is someone who is determined to be a poet, wants it enough to read and study those deemed to be claiming to be poets, a mysteriously undefinable club, begging absolute freedom for contradiction, that uneasy comfort of nonconformity, constantly seeking the safety of distance to confess ignorance, fear, ecstasy, and suspicion. Poetry, the delirious diary of existence, those fragmented lingo bits gathered and strewn, a display intoning straight-on honest spews, or veering into through the elliptical, surreal, bajibbity voodoo of language voiced and heard, our scribbled account of dreams whispered. I have made myself a poet because I claim I am. Therefore, just ask me, and I will tell you, I am a poet, I think. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Very musical, that one, too. Yes. yes, and the old childhood rhyme, if you're a poet. This is kind of the first episode of Poets in Montana, and uh, subsequent episodes will be Taken away by Mark Gibbons. And all my friends. And all his friends. I guess the easiest way to probably contact me is just through email. That's, that's how old school I am. Uh, and it's just Marco, M-A-R-C-O, Gibbo, G-I-B-B-O, at yahoo.com. I'm one of the last people still on Yahoo. <laughs> He really is. <laughs> and, and if you are interested in uh, booking a presentation by Mark, the directions on how to do that are on the humanitiesmontana.org website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to do that as much as possible. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, several poems came out of, of work experiences. Uh, one of those uh, uh, experiences I would deliver uh, to the old pulp mill uh, out at uh, Frenchtown which was, uh, you know, a 
there forever in, uh, uh, well, not forever, but from the 50s uh, into uh, whenever it uh, went down, about 20 years ago at this point, I guess. But uh, this, this poem was, again, another, uh, as you've noticed probably, most of these are narratives. It's called Transformers. Transmission of power, transformers and towers, Insulators and hard hats and dishes strung along the railroad spur, lines of convenience, gallows frames of hope for production, for jobs, for money. The hum of turbines, the clatter of engines, the occasional clutch of manual laborers scratching their nuts and waiting for operators. A crane pivots against the patchwork blue of a clear-cut hillside and rolls through sulfur steam rising from settling ponds. Hydraulics and steel, the march of mankind, machines turning, churning around the clock, cranking out tons of hot liner board to make cardboard boxes so we can package our lives. Pulp fiction, the shit we buy, the reason why we work all this overtime. When I was a kid, we called it the fart factory. Today, we call it the only thing left. Besides television and the internet, safe sex and cigarettes, the financial security of a credit card debt. Heister clamps and forklifts, flashing lights and beepers load trucks by appointment at only two of five doors. It's slow, there's no waiting anymore, except for the open boxcars, empty and eerily useless, pointless as coffins in a crematory. And the trucks idle, and the clock ticks, and the crane returns along the berm of the next Superfund site. Another skeleton of cancerous capitalism lumbers by, its driver masked and wearing surgical gloves. As a young man, I worked inside the belly of the beast for a short time, knee-deep in chemical foam, buried under the steaming fibers of digested trees, but I escaped, had to be outside. I had to see, breathe the sky, couldn't have survived in the hay, swinging through night and day in the guts of the paper mill. So here I am, watching from behind my steering wheel, delivering another truckload to this poisonous old plant that gave us what we needed what we wanted, what we asked for, and much more. The stuff of 50 years. Maybe that V of Canadian geese overhead could teach us something about form and direction, about loyalty and living and knowing how to get back home to that place that costs us nothing and everything. That place on the ground we carry with us when we go. This is a very dark book. <laughs> I mean, not that the others aren't. This baby is, is much darker, and I don't exactly know why that is. It was about 2014, I guess. But, uh, for example, uh, I dealt with, uh, with, with my ever-present anger in this next poem. Uh, and anger is definitely a part of my life. I've, I think I'm much better with it now than I used to be, I, 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 which is the case, I guess, when we're younger. But uh, anyway, I, I wrote this poem, uh, you know, probably almost 20 years ago now, and, uh, or at least over, over 10, yeah, over 10 years ago probably. And uh, it's called I Lie With It. The old lady says I have anger issues, and I agree that I let shit piss me off. Why? 
I don't know, and I don't care to analyze it because I'm absolutely certain I'm justified in raging when something outrageous occurs, like when some asshole doesn't use his blinker or has the unquestioned last word about everything and informs me that everyone over 40 votes Republican. That's the kind of shit that drives me crazy, like the fat fucks that listen to Rush Limbaugh and the other talk radio nuts, those good old Murricans who buy up the multinational corporate dream that somehow allows them to rant about sacrificing for God and Walmart and borders that don't exist as if our soldiers die for something besides the almighty dollars collected and spent by the drones of the world? Maybe that's a little harsh, a wee bit over the top, or maybe not. Usually these moods tailgate events like the oil geyser greasing the Gulf of Mexico or the death of another friend, which happens too often after 50 plus years and is easily amped up by four or five beers because then I'll tell you what I really think. I become the cynical prick of wisdom. After a few drinks loaded with pot shots and a witty chip on my Dick Hugo sized shoulders, a wannabe Jimbo Dicky, drunk as Dylan Thomas lying on the stage, streamlined as my old friend from the East End, Dicky D, powder monkey of the edgy grin and gritted teeth. Mocking the sins of the working class clowns who know they're fucked, yet living this, living like Zuluni kings. We're such silly assed, trash spoiled, gotta spend it sons of bitches. And I think that's mainly why most often I probably get mad, crazy mad as my dad on a Lenny Bruce roll like a twainy wild man who doesn't want to play along but is not sure of anything anymore. Are you? Maybe the monsters were wrong, their songs too full of violence and sex, delta blues and barbecued pork loins screaming at me to eat art, the satiating lie that whispers truth and makes me think I'm not the only sad sack of declining testosterone perched on the branches of despair, orgasm, and lunacy breaking down. Believe me, I'd rather not be right, and I'd rather not get angry, but count blossoms and blessings. My preference for breaking has always been into tears. Whew. Wow, there was a rant for you. Yeah, I know everybody's got a lot of that in them. <laughs> All you got to do is read the paper and watch TV. This is called Prospects. And uh, my grandfather uh, came to this country in uh, 1916, which was a pivotal year in Ireland uh, where he left and, uh, and came here. and. Uh, and they settled in Montana. So this kind of has to do with that. Prospects. My grandfather was Irish, so he drank a wee bit sometimes. Most of the times he felt like it, and he felt like it a lot, a lot of the time. My grandfather, Martin, was handy with his mitts, a shovel, a pick. He was at home in the dirt following his nose, his eyes, alert to veins in the earth. My grandfather was a rock hound who scanned the ground for gold and silver deposits of ore in stone. Whatever paid, he assayed by lantern light in a one-room shack, the jeweler's glass tucked into his eye socket. My grandfather visited us for a week each year 
showed his stash of shiny rocks, some heavy, some colored, some crystalline wonders he'd roll with his fingers so they'd glitter in the light. My grandfather doodled Irish ditties, tapped his feet, nipped at a jug of whiskey in his valise, his brogue a foreign song to my ears. To some, my grandfather was a joke, a crazy dreamer, a deadbeat mick, a travesty in the mouths of those sanctimonious shit heels who spoke behind his back about his wife and kids, scrounging pennies for eggs and potatoes while he was off striking it rich, but not, it's true. My grandfather drank a lot of his paydays, got in more than a few fights he couldn't walk away from. He hated bullies, injustice, the blind arrogance of comfort, those silent generations of English who took their tea regularly as Irish died hungry. My grandfather believed in this land of opportunity, the freedom to roam, to dig, to stake a claim, to break away from the bonds he'd known all his life, the hopeless promise of poverty. My grandfather was a blue-eyed dreamer, no black Irish blues singer, but he knew the rhythms of labor, the arc of the pick, his breath danced with hand tools to dig ditches and sewers, graves and cesspools, glory holes and stope muck. My grandfather lived for the moments he could sift and scratch fractured rock through calloused hands, palm nuggets he'd carry home in a bag to be graded and tagged, spread out across his table. My grandfather wasn't deterred by those who looked down their noses at his schemes. He became a slag monk of sorts after my grandmother sent him packing back to Glen, Montana, where he found himself a mountain of iron ore. My grandfather drank daily and wintered well under the tarp on his bed, broke ice on the water bucket mornings in his shack to wash his face, wipe the sleep from his eyes, then toddle on down to Grogan's bar for breakfast. My grandfather ordered two in the water and a boiled spud, was proud of John Fitzgerald Kennedy and wasn't surprised when they shot him dead. He ordered a shot of house whiskey and butter for his tea. It was as close to Ireland as he could get at 10 below zero in Beaverhead County, waiting for the flow, the luxury and ease of opportune dreams to wash over him and warm the day's prospects. Time filled 